Let's turn together in God's Word to Acts 14. Acts 14, we're going to look at verses 19 through 28 this morning. Acts 14, verse 19 through 28. So just by way of reminder, in uh, verses uh, 9 through 18, or 8 through 18, uh, Paul and Barnabas have uh, performed miracles in Lystra, and they wanted to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, and, and they ran into the crowd, convinced them that they shouldn't do this. It says in verse 18, even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. And the account continues in verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, and when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Ataliah, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when, they had and when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. So far, the reading from God's word this morning, may he add its blessing to our hearts. Well, the popular message of the church these days is that the life of the Christian is a life of ease and comfort. It's called the prosperity gospel, and the prosperity gospel is very popular in today's Christian circles. And the basic tenet of the prosperity gospel is that temporal success must accompany the Christian when he comes to God by faith. Now, the problem, of course, with that main basic tenet is that it eliminates most people outside of the wealthy West who call on the name of the Lord. It would say that those people simply do not have enough faith. The problem, of course, also is in looking at the history of the church. It's contrary to the experience of the church throughout the ages. Suffering has always been part of the experience of the church. And here in this passage, through a uh, kind of Paul's mini-sermon, especially focused on verse 22, we see that the disciples of Christ are called by God, in fact, to endure hardship as he uses them to establish his church in the world. So as we, as we learned that lesson this morning, we want to see three things. First, we want to look at the stoning of Paul in verse 19. Then we want to look at the meaning of Paul's stoning for the church in verses 20 through 23. And then we want to look at the report that Paul and Barnabas make to the apostles in verses 24 through 28. So the disciples of Christ are called by God to endure hardship as he uses them to establish his church in the world. We're going to look at the stoning of Paul, the meaning for the church, and the report of the apostles. So let's begin by looking at the stoning of Paul. There's a striking contrast in this passage compared to last week's, isn't there? That's why I read a little bit of verse 18. And this whole idea of Paul being the object of their worship last Lord's Day, and this Lord's Day, the intense hostility that is before and that is experienced by Paul and Barnabas. Last Lord's Day, Paul's miraculous healing of a man crippled from birth makes them think that he's uh, Hermes and Barnabas is Zeus and they want to offer sacrifices to them. And even in that, that, that event, the apostles had great difficulty in keeping the word. They had to plead with them not to offer sacrifices uh, to them. But this passage is, is extremely different, where in verses 8 through 18 you had this idolatrous adulation from the crowd. Here in verses 19 and 20 you have a murderous hostility that comes from the crowds. Now, what happened between verse 18 and verse 19? How could the change be so 
rapid. Well, Paul's past came back to haunt him. That's what happened. If you look in, in the passage in verse 19, it says Jews from Antioch and Iconium came. Those are the two cities where they had just planted the little churches before. And they pursued Paul. Paul fled and they pursued. The ones Paul thought to have escaped, they came and found him. You remember from chapter 13 and verse 15 in Pisidian Antioch, there was an initial joy. But eventually the people convinced the, the, uh, the, the rulers convinced the people to chase Paul and, and Barnabas away. So that happened in Pisidian Antioch. In Iconium, it was a similar response. Initially there was a, a reception, but finally they had to flee for their lives as they found out that there was a plot to kill them by stoning. And Paul may have fled, but the Jews were not finished yet. They weren't done with Paul and Barnabas. This is the same rage that the devil has against the people of God. For example, in Revelation 12 and verse 17, you have uh, as part of, of John's vision, you have the, the, the account of the woman and her son being chased by the dragon. The woman, the fulfillment of the seed of the woman, the dragon impersonating the devil, being a picture of the devil. And, and we see in Revelation 12 that the woman is protected. The child is protected. The, the earth opens up and water flows between so that the dragon can uh, get to the woman. And, and so the woman is protected. But what is the response of the dragon? The dragon is, is, is enraged. And he goes forward and he makes war on the rest of the offspring of the woman. He goes to fight against the church. Last Lord's Day we saw 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 where it talks about the devil prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Well, you see the fruit of his labor in this passage. Paul and Barnabas are experiencing the prowling, the roaring, the fury of Satan seeking someone to devour. And what Paul and Barnabas experience is true persecution. We do not face true persecution in this land. Not yet. We do not endure persecution. Paul is facing persecution. There is an attempt to intimidate the Christian faith, to eliminate the Christian faith by force. And Paul faces the brunt of it. We see, of course, true persecution in our day as well. We simply don't see it here. You can use as an example what happened just a few days ago. A family, a family of suicide bombers attacking three different churches of various stripes in Surabaya, Indonesia. Can you imagine it? A, a husband dropping off his wife and his six and nine-year-old daughter at one church. And his 16 and 18-year-old son taking a motorcycle to another church. And the father driving his SUV to the third church walking into these places and detonating bombs that are strapped to them, killing themselves and killing eight believers and wounding 40 others. That, my friends, that is true persecution. And we don't face that here. That is persecution, and it has been going on all over the world during all sorts of different times. Why is that so? Why is it that persecution keeps cropping up in the life of the church. Well, I hope it doesn't surprise you that as believers, we are promised persecution. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 12, it says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not might be persecuted, will be persecuted. The Christian life includes the promise of persecution and hardship. And in Lystra, Paul is the recipient of it. The Jews, they persuade the crowds, they carry out the plan that's hatched in Iconium, and, and this time Paul can't flee. He has no time to respond. Paul is stoned, left for dead after he's dragged outside the city. Now, you and I, we may face pressure, and we may face people who laugh at us, and we may face people who even call us names 
But until this kind of thing is part of your experience, you have not been persecuted. We have not in North America experienced persecution in the church. Now, what does that mean for the church, this stoning of, of Paul? Some people are asked by God to give their lives for their faith. Paul is not asked that at this time. According to, to tradition, Paul is asked to do that later on. And uh, by way of tradition, Paul apparently is beheaded in Rome in the year A.D. 62 or 63, somewhere around there. But this time, God spares Paul. His life isn't taken. After the mob leaves, the, the disciples gather around him and he gets up and he goes into the city. Now, as those of us who frequently read Scripture and perhaps have read this account many times, we should sometimes pause and think about what it is that we're reading. You see, what's happened to Paul, he didn't just have a bad day. It's not that Paul could pick himself up, dust himself off, take an Advil, and then get on with life. Paul has just been left for dead after people threw rocks at him until he fell. A mob has seized him. They have surrounded him. They have pelted him with stones. He fell in such a way that they thought he was dead. And then what did they do to him? They didn't pick him up and lay him in a tomb. They dragged him out of the city. Now, I don't know if you've ever been dragged across a road, but you don't look very pretty when they're done with you. This is who Paul was. This is what Paul looked like. He suffered for the name of Christ. He, his head was probably killing him. His, his body was covered in scrapes and, and bruises. Maybe he even had broken bones because of the stones that people were throwing at him. Well, what does it say? He goes into the city... And the next day, he gets up and he goes to Derby and he preaches the gospel. This is the church planting, uh, church planting strategy for, for Paul. Now, what is the trajectory of Paul's church planting strategy? Let's review it for a minute. In Antioch, chased out of the city. In Iconium, threatened with death flees for his life. In Lystra, his enemies find him. He's stoned. He's left for dead on the ground. And, and people leave him thinking that they have accomplished their purposes. That, my friends, is not a success tour. That's not the strategy they're going to teach you in seminary if you're in a church planting track. They're not going to set that in front of you. This is suffering and agony for the sake of Christ. But it's not something that just Paul endures. Even in the book of Acts, it's not just something that Paul endures. Think of what happened to Stephen already in, in Acts 7. Stoned by the people of Jerusalem for declaring the truth. And he actually did die at their hands. We see the whole church in Jerusalem scattered from early church history, say the first, uh, first 300 years after Christ walked on the earth. We know of seven major persecutions enacted on the church by the Roman government. Some of them were regional and local. One of them was called the Great Persecution in, in 297 AD, lasted for four years where many Christians lost their lives until Constantine uh, re removed the ban on Christianity that was part of the, the Roman Empire. The church has been birthed in persecution. The church has been birthed in suffering. Tertullian, uh, uh, a second century theologian, wrote, The blood of the martyrs are the seed of the church. It's right. The church has grown through the blood of the martyrs, through suffering. In, in, uh, in the Gospels themselves, there is this picture of suffering that is part of the Christian life. And so as the Lord Jesus suffers... So his uh, followers are expected to suffer as well. And that's, that's Paul's assessment here in, in this chapter, in verse 22. He strengthens the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. As the Lord Jesus suffered, so we should be expected to suffer. 
And so as Paul is concluding this, this first missionary journey, he's going around to all these young churches that have been established. And he's setting before them this word of encouragement, this word that's supposed to strengthen them. Through many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of God. How's that for a feel-good sermon? How's that for a, for a pick-me-up, right? What we need is more good news. Through many tribulations, you will enter into the kingdom of God. Now, those words are intended to strengthen and encourage the church. How can that be? How can those words encourage and strengthen the churches that Paul has just established? Well, Paul is saying to them, what has just happened to me, that is normal for the Christian. It says in the Gospels, twice in the Gospel of Matthew, one time in the Gospel of Mark, one time in the Gospel of Luke, the, this call by Christ that disciples learn to deny themselves and follow after Him. I want to read from you, to you from, from Romans 8 and verse 16 and 17 so we can get a picture of how this runs all throughout Scripture, this call to endure suffering. Uh, Romans 8 verse 16, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So far, so good. We like it so far, right? Provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We are proved heirs, Paul says. We are proved heirs of Christ when we suffer with him. Also in Philippians 1 and verse 29, we read something similar. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer loss for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Paul is saying to the church, suffering is granted to you. It's given to you. It's a gift for you. The point is that suffering is, is normal for the Christian. It's part of the Christian experience. So Paul is exhorting them. He's saying, as we enter the kingdom of God, we do it through many tribulations. Now, what Paul is not saying is that suffering is the key to your entrance into the kingdom of God. Paul is not saying that because you suffer, therefore God will, will, will welcome you, as if somehow your suffering is a merit, a merit that is to be earned by you. Paul's not, he's not saying that. He's not saying that you earn merit by your suffering. Instead, he is saying that the path from justification to glorification is littered with suffering. That's what Paul's saying. Our union with Christ, that's what gives us access to God. That's how we're redeemed, through our union with Christ. But as God calls us from justification all the way to the time when He calls us home or until He returns, that walk is littered with suffering. Suffering is normal for the Christian. So Paul is he's issuing a, a steady command. You know what I mean by that? You know, you know how they used to fight? They used to fight. Uh, we were talking about it at home the other day. Armies used to fight. They would march a couple of lines across the field, and they, they, then they hurled projectiles at each other, right? It's either spears or, or bows and arrows or muskets, and they'd line up, and, and everybody, get, everybody gets a turn, and then when they see a line breaking, one of them would say, this is our opportunity, and they'd take sharp objects and they'd charge at the other people, screaming and yelling as they went. And the people who are in charge of the defending army, they would stand there, right? Maybe you've seen this in a movie or you've read it in a book, and you can almost hear their voice, right? Steady, hold, hold, to keep the soldiers where they are so that they would be able to defend their nation, defend their tribe, defend their village. Well, that's the kind of command that Paul's issuing here in this passage. He's calling them to be steady, to face the onslaught, and to know that in the middle of this onslaught there is safety, safety in their union with Christ, the, the things of this world not to be held on to but forsaken. But we're to be steady in Christ. And so that's what Paul and Barnabas are, are doing. That's their mission as they make this little tour, as they go their way back to Antioch, the Antioch in, in uh, just north of, of Israel. 
as they're, they're going there. They, they want to steady the young churches that they have just been able to form. And to solidify them after they leave, you see in, in our passage as well that they establish elders. They establish elders in each of the churches. You see in the New Testament church, uh, not a top-down where one guy is in charge of a whole region, but how each church has their own elders which are to rule and govern and shepherd and lead the congregation uh, when the apostles go away. Uh, their ordination, it's a, it's a solemn event, isn't it? It's accompanied by prayer, with fasting, with commitment to the Lord, showing that God is at the center of these churches. And therefore, the things of this world are not to be held on to. We're to hold on to Christ. We're to hold on to the one who is the center of the church. So we've seen the stoning of Paul. We've seen its significance for the church. And now we want to see the report that Paul and Barnabas make to the apostles, uh, the apostles make to the church in Antioch. Paul and Barnabas have done their circuit around Asia Minor. They've covered Cyprus and they set sail from Adalia, which is a port on the Mediterranean, and they sail across back to the uh, back to the Antioch from which they left. It's not the Antioch where Paul was cast out. It's the Antioch that sent them on their journey in the first place. It's Antioch where the mission to the Gentiles began in earnest. You remember that? Some of them came up there and they began to speak to the Greeks as well as to the Jews. So in effect, Paul and Barnabas are returning to their sending church. They had fulfilled their task, it says in verse 26, and they're returning home. And Paul, when he returns home, he gives a report of what took place. You see that? Paul, in his report, where is Paul focused? Is Paul focused on what he did? It says in verse 27 that Paul declared all that God had done with them. Here you see the great missionaries giving praise to God that God had done among the Gentiles. God did what no man could do. He opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. He opens it for the Gentiles. Everyone who is not a Jew is given direct access to redemption in Christ Jesus by faith. God does that work. Paul can't do that work. Paul's just a vessel who declares, but God opens their hearts to receive it. There is, a, uh, there is not any report that the disciples are shocked or discouraged by what happened to Paul and Barnabas. They recognize the truth that, that suffering is, a, is, a refining, is the refining path, the, the evidence of following after Christ, the cost of standing for the truth. It's Christ's seal in a way. It's our seal as well that when we suffer for doing what is faithful, that we are doing what Christ did before us. And so what do we learn as a congregation from these tribulations that Paul and Barnabas suffered? Well, I want to ask us a question. I want to ask if we are, as a congregation, ready to enter the kingdom of God through many tribulations. And this question should really prompt us to ask two other questions. The first question that I want us to consider is why does the church in the United States not face persecution? Why is that? Now, of course, there's not a simple, universal answer to that question. There's simply too many different kinds of churches, too many stripes, too many, too many, too many denominations with different emphases, too many strengths, too many weaknesses. And certainly God doesn't guarantee that there will be constant persecution in the church. Even in the book of Acts, there are seasons of great peace in the church. But think about the last time there was persecution in the Christian church on this continent or, or in the West. When is the last time that the church of God faced persecution? You have to go back maybe to the time of the Reformation, Bloody Mary, to see kind of a national persecution of Christians? Now, why is that? There's different reasons for that, of course. I think part of the explanation can come that when this nation was founded, that there was a general agreement with what Scripture taught. Whether or not people believed it all or not, that's a different story, and there could be many people who were simply compliant on the outside. Certainly, we have to recognize that that could be true. But for many centuries, there was no real challenge to the Christian faith in this land, maybe not until Darwin or until, until the, the ideas of the French Revolution came over this way. 
there was an acknowledgement of Scripture, at least as good. Maybe they didn't trust Christ, but they acknowledged that the teaching of Scripture was good. But since that time, there has been a growing divide in our nation where, 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 where the Scriptures are not recognized as true and where, where Christianity isn't held uh, as something to be pursued or imitated or, or followed. And yet, the church in our country has not faced any persecution of any kind at all. Could it be that the church has become too comfortable? Could it be that Cliffwood Presbyterian Church has become too comfortable? Is it possible that we have forsaken the love of Christ and become silent about the very issues that prove our love for Him? Have we become silent about the warnings of the gospel? We have to admit, at least in part, that this is at least part of the reason why the world leaves the church alone. The church has become too comfortable. The church is intent on removing any talk of sin. She has left behind the warning of hell, the hope we have exclusively in Christ. She has become silent on the Christian duties of the disciples of Christ. The church has become well, the church has become like the sermon that was preached at the royal wedding, right? The church has become about love in some undefined and, and unrestricted way, meaning mostly tolerance, I think. The church has become something that she was never meant to be. The love of Scripture isn't a love that conquers everything because it accepts everything. It's true Jesus' love does conquer everything, but what is not declared in the, by the church is what that love of Christ means. What is this love of Christ that conquers everything? Well, Christ's love, it's, it's manifest in suffering, isn't it? Isn't it manifest in suffering the wrath of His Father for the sins of His people? Isn't that what the love of Christ is? And where is that message? Where is that message being displayed? Isn't, isn't Christ's love shown in making man acceptable to God? In removing the guilt of his sin and placing his own righteousness on him? Isn't that where the righteousness or where the love of, of Christ is shown? And doesn't that also mean that where the love of Christ places righteousness on the sinner and the sinner is redeemed, where his righteousness does not rest on the sinner, the wrath of God remains? Isn't that part of the love of God? Love for righteousness? Love for purity? Hatred of sin? And where is that message in the church? It's in the explicit definitions of the gospel message that the gospel message becomes offensive. It's when the gospel is explained in all its meaning that people either turn to it because of the grace of God or they resist it, hate it, and flee from it and persecute it because they remain under the power of the flesh. We have to confess that the church has toned down its message in our nation. We have coddled the world to such an extent that the church has no reason to be offended by the church. Or the world has no reason to be offended by uh, the church. Isn't that true? She says things they don't mind hearing, and she watches quietly as, as millions of people drive off the cliff to their eternal condemnation, their eternal destruction. So why is the church in the U.S. not facing persecution? Because she's not being faithful. She's not declaring the gospel as she should, at least in part. That has to be part of the explanation. And the second question that I want us to consider this morning is whether or not the church is willing to deny itself, to take up its cross, and to follow Christ. If Paul teaches us that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God, is that something that we're interested in as a church? Is that something that we think we should pursue as a church? 
The next logical question is, if we know what we should do, are we willing to do it and pay the price? The lesson for us is, is not to only see God's approval when we're suffering, but it is also to not shy away from the truth when suffering comes. The church has to get back to a faithful declaration of the church, of the truth. The church has to declare it to each other and has to declare it to those outside the walls of the church as well. Let me ask you something. I, I experienced this myself growing up. Uh, when I would go to my grandfather's house, he had a rule. There were two things you couldn't talk about at the dinner table. Religion and politics. Well, why is that? Because religion can be controversial. Religion can make people upset. Religion can make a family Thanksgiving dinner turn into a food fight. The gospel isn't inclusive. It's exclusive. And people don't like to hear it. And so, in my grandfather's home, he had made a decision. He would rather keep the peace than pursue the truth. Now, what do our homes look like? What do our homes look like? Do they look like places where we would rather keep the peace? Now, hear me. I'm not saying that every family meal has to become a battleground. I'm not saying that every time you have an opportunity, you have to stick your finger in your uncle's eye who's not a believer yet and, and make sure he feels it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we should be willing to offend for the sake of Christ in every place in our life. Not looking to offend, but willing to offend. In the world, to be a Christian is, is less and less popular. The world, I'm not just talking about our country, the world is adopting darkness and, and death, as is evidenced in Ireland. 66% of the people voted to legalize the murder of the unborn. So if you are a Christian, you have to know that what you believe, if you really say what you believe, it's not going to be popular. People are not going to like it. Even if you say it nicely, they're not going to embrace it because what you are saying is attacking the very core of their being. And the core of their being is saying, it's shouting, I am okay. And Scripture says that's simply not true. Scripture says unless you are in Christ... You are dead in your sins and trespasses. And to say that, it's, it's not popular, and, and you can't repackage it to make it popular without gutting its contents. So we, as, as God's people, have to recognize that we owe Him our, our very lives. We owe, him, we, we owe to Him our redemption, and we owe to Him subsequently our obedience. So are we ever willing to suffer loss for the sake of Christ? I hope the answer for you is yes. I hope the answer for me is yes. And if, it, and if it's not yes, I hope that we're praying to the Lord, seeking to repent of our apathy and to live for Him. Praying that God would change our hearts in such a way that we would resemble His disciples, those who are willing to suffer for His name and count it joy. From this passage, we see that the disciples of Christ are, are called by God to endure hardship. We're called by God to endure persecution at times. That's what Paul endured here in this section of Scripture. We may be asked to endure this persecution in our day as well. Who knows what the Lord has in store? God does not promise ease and prosperity to His church. He doesn't promise ease and prosperity to His people. But He does say that through these hardships, He will do His work. He will build his church. And you know what's the glorious truth of it? The gates of hell will never prevail against her. Let's pray.